I'm happy to introduce um, Dr. Polly Baker, who's Sports and Exercise Medicine Consultant, um, working down in Kent. Um, and I'll let her introduce the team that are going to speak with her um, around the design and delivery of a sports and exercise medicine um, led service for long COVID. So over to you, Polly. Um, thank you, Kay. And um, thank you to Badham for having us all. Um, as a team, I think I can speak for everyone. We're very excited to be here. It's a shame, obviously, we're not all meeting in person, but totally understandable. Um, really grateful to present our service. We're very proud of it and believe it demonstrates um, an interdisciplinary approach as well as a patient-centered approach. Um, but you tell us when we get to the end of the presentation. So um, over to the team. So there's myself, Dr. Polly Baker, as you've already said, I'm a consultant in sport and exercise medicine. Um, I work over a number of settings, including elite sport, military, and also private. We have another four members of the team. So going along to the right, we've got um, Mrs. Maxine Haylock, who is an occupational therapist. She works out of Medway in the chronic fatigue service and historically has worked um, in the military on the chronic fatigue service as well. Then along one more is Miss Christine Parr, who will be presenting today, is one of our occupational therapists. She has more of a specialist interest in neuro rehabilitation, sort of cognitive dysfunction, and currently is an independent occupational therapist working in Surrey, mainly working with neurological um, dysfunction. But historically, again, has worked within the military, but this time um, within the MTBI, so minor traumatic brain injury um, service. Next along is Jenny, Mrs. Jenny Turnbull, who um, is a respiratory physiotherapist. She was pivotal along with the rest of the team in setting up the service um, and worked both out of Spire, Tunbridge Wells, but also at Guy's and St. Tommy's and was at the forefront of the acute COVID response, but also has been central in setting up an NHS led um, service um, within Guy's and St. Tommy's. And to be clear, this, our services is a private led service within Spire Tunbridge Wells. Last but certainly not least is um, Sharon, who is a musculoskeletal physiotherapist. Um, she has an interest in vestibular and also spinal physiotherapy um, and is also absolutely exemplary in managing complex, complex case management. So that's the whole team. Um, just going on really, we know so much now about acute COVID and, and have got it sort of coming out of our ears in terms of knowledge and understanding. Our, our knowledge of long COVID, however, and unfortunately is, is less good. Um, and we really are having to use our knowledge from other sort of skills like MTBI and um, chronic fatigue in managing this condition. What we, what we do um, potentially know is that previous neuroimmunology studies that have looked at similar, well, looked at conditions with similar symptoms. So for example, chronic fatigue syndrome or depression or chronic pain, those studies have shown that there's, there tends to be a sort of central inflammatory response and that we think that possibly this is due to sort of an upregulation of activation of microglii, which are the, the macrophages of the central nervous system. And that in turn, causes a cascade of um, cell signaling pathways, which increases that cytokine um, secretion. And that gives rise to a lot of the symptoms like fatigue, brain fog, and so on. In terms of the most up-to-date guidance, um, it defines COVID into sort of three entities. We have acute COVID, which is thought to be between um, zero to four weeks. And then from four weeks to 12 weeks, because you're no longer able to um, extract virally, um, rep, sorry, no longer able to extract um, virals, viruses that are able to replicate, we now just call this prolonged symptoms. And it's only when we get to the 12 week mark that we define ongoing symptoms as post COVID-19 syndrome. And the sort of the, the nice definition is signs and symptoms that develop during or after an infection consistent with COVID-19 continue for more than 12 weeks, which I've already mentioned, and are not explained by an alternative diagnosis. 
For the purpose of this presentation, and actually for the purposes of what we do clinically, we talk about um, that presentation as long COVID, primarily because it sort of encompasses everything, but also because patients are feeling much more comfortable with that terminology. And one of the key principles of rehabilitation in this, with this condition is that it's patient-centered. So going on, um, one thing to be clear about with this definition is that we have a lot of symptoms that can be um, part of long COVID and that each of those can affect any of the different body systems. And as the number of, of symptoms increases, we find that they're, they're more interrelated. So if we look at this diagram here, this looks as though each symptom that is, is evident for a patient is a, its own separate entity. However, it's much more like this. So just to give you a sort of an, an example from my head, you could have an individual that's just had acute COVID. They've been laid up in bed for two weeks, not really moving. They've lo lost a bit of their conditioning. They've got a background of maybe getting a little bit anxious about health conditions, as a lot of us are. They get up and about and they realise that they're a bit more breathless than they, they first thought they were. And then that drives their anxiety and they get into a bit of a positive um, sort of exacerbation of their symptoms. They then become more fatigued because they're anxious so they're not sleeping well, they reduce concentration and so on. So you can start to see that all those symptoms can be interrelated. So one of, one of my key responsibilities as the consultant of the service, I believe, is to really delineate and establish what the symptoms are for that patient and how many there are and how important or how much they how much each symptom impacts on, on them. So within, uh, within a history, I will go into a lot of detail and, and find out those problems in order of impact. And then from there, I will try and exclude medical conditions, either in the initial consultation or with the help of additional specialists or through the additional investigations. And then, and then what I need to do is essentially risk uh, is stratify their rehabilitation. And what I wanted to demonstrate here with this slide is that as you get the increasing number of symptoms, you get that, that increased interrelation of the problems. And so your approach to that patient should become more integrated. So if, for example, um, a patient has purely breathlessness and a little bit of anxiety, they could quite safely be managed by one allied health professional, whether that's an occupational therapist or physiotherapist, with a GP as a, as a sort of a go-to for any um, medical related concerns. If they develop maybe three or four, a, a multidisciplinary approach would be more appropriate. And by this, I mean that there's more healthcare professionals involved, whether specialists or allied healthcare professionals, but those individuals are seeing the patient separately and then they're coming together to discuss the patient and come up with a plan um, and uh, a sort of management plan going forward. An interdisciplinary approach um, is when that patient really has so much going on, potentially they've had the symptoms for a long time, that really they need to be seen by the team it all together. So the team will um, assess them, come up with a management, management plan um, and go on from there. So if you're strapped for time, um, I think a lot of people that deal with long COVID patients can testify that long, they, it takes a lot of time because there's a lot to go through. It can be really helpful to get the, get the patient to complete a Yorkshire assessment tool before coming into your clinic. So that, can, that helps you get that list of problems and order of severity. So what I, what are, this, is, this is essentially a um, slide illustrating our pathways. And what I'd like to go through is demonstrate how that integrated approach is applied. So in essence, our patient can enter the service either through a referral from a specialist, self-referral um, or a referral from the physiotherapist. And our administrators ask the patient six questions. An example being, do you need to nap during the day for your fatigue? If they answer yes to all those questions, that delineates them as a low rehab needs patient. And then they can enter either into the physiotherapy or occupational therapy stream without too much involvement from a doctor. 
If, however, they answer no on any of those six questions, they would need that fuller assessment, which is what I get involved in. And I've performed most of those initial consultations virtually. And within that, um, I would conduct the Yorkshire assessment tool that I've just mentioned, but also a number of other outcomes, which I'll come on to in a minute. Then from that consultation, you can delineate whether the, um, the patient needs multidisciplinary input. And I'm not sure if, I don't think you can see my arrow, can you, if I move it? I think, so if you can't, it's going from the yellow box, which says Dr. Baker's Long COVID Clinic across to physiotherapy, cardiology. That patient would enter and see one or two of those, those um, either specialists or healthcare professionals. And then they would come back to my clinic to find out how they're getting on. If, however, they are complex and fulfill any of these criteria, I will come back to that again. I'll just, I'll just go back to this picture. Um, they would then enter the long COVID IDT clinic, which is that green, um, that green oval shape just there. And that is where they would see myself, along with um, one of the occupational therapists and one of the physiotherapists. Okay, so this is the criteria again. Okay, so what I thought we would do now is just go through an example so that you can see how we work as a service. Um, so this was a 36 year old male who came to see me. He was, he was a self-referral, um, his wife worked for AXA and she found out that we ran a service at Spire. So she came along, he came along that way. He was unwell in the summer with symptoms compatible, compatible with an acute COVID-19 infection and he'd had a positive swab. He had self-managed himself and got back to about 60% of his sort of feeling normal with his energy levels. But then when his daughter brought back a cold from nursery, he regressed quite significantly. And that's when he came to us um, with the following symptoms. In order of um, severity, he rated his problems as being breathlessness, fatigue, brain fog, low mood and unrefreshed sleep. He had a history of MTBI, which was important to note, particularly with the brain fog and road traffic accident with a tib fib fracture. He had no medications, no allergies. And then what was really important within his social history, and actually I haven't got it written here, but um, is that he worked night shifts and the work that he did on nights was um, quite brain heavy. So he was a data analyst looking at screens he also had a three week old um, son and a young girl, but luckily they slept very well. So that wasn't um, impacting too much on his fatigue. So he fulfilled those criteria of entering into the interdisciplinary clinic. So I took a full history, which you've got there. And then he came into the clinic and was seen by one of our physiotherapists and our respiratory physiotherapist. So within that clinic, essentially, all the healthcare professionals that are in it have already seen my letter with the full history. So we have a bit more time. So we allow any additional questions, but we spend most of the time completing the examination and determining the management. So we got our nurses to complete these observations before they come in. We do a lying and standing blood pressure because there is, um, we do see quite a lot of uh, hypotension or postural uh, low blood pressure. So it's worth identifying that. Um, and then we get them to fill in the following outcomes. So I won't spend ages on this, but the EQ 5D 5L is a general outcome measure looking at five domains of your life. So anxiety, depression, pain, mobility, um, low scores are good, high scores aren't. So actually with this individual, they look relatively good. He rates his health, which um, is the 85, as 85% of normal. So actually you're sort of like, oh, he seems quite good. However, the, you, you then come on to the COVID functional score, which is out of five. And uh, three, sort of above three and above is, is fairly debilitated. So there's a little bit of a mismatch there, which tells us a little bit about his personality, which is helpful. There's then the work and social adjustment score. So 40 out of 40 is bad. <laughs> it means their condition is impacting on their work and ability to participate in social activities. So again, not too bad, but 10 out of 40. GAD7, I'm sure lots of you will be familiar with, is anxiety. So that's moderate. And PHQ9 uh, is depression. So mild to moderate. And then Childer is a fatigue score and he's severely fatigued. 
So quite interesting there, his scores. We then perform a full examination and if they present with headaches or brain fog, we do look at their cervical spine as well because that seems to contribute quite significantly. Jenny does um, her dysfunctional breathing assessment and then if they haven't had bloods done already, we'll do a fatigue screen. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about what bloods we do and why at the end of the presentation. So, sorry, I'm just having problems clicking on. So what we do at that point is we then ask the, um, in the, the patient to leave. We then have a discussion all together and we come up with what we believe is going on. So um, a biopsychosocial formulation of what's going on for that, um, for that patient. So the patient definitely has long COVID. We know that, but why do they have it? We also, we find this is very helpful that we all know what we're gonna be saying to the patient. We're all singing from the same hymn sheet, so to speak. And I believe, and there are studies that demonstrate that that can, um, that can help with behavioral change. And a lot of the treatment we're, we're recommending is behavioral intervention. So we really need that buy-in. We always try and prescribe some type of physical activity. Um, and that can be as little as walk for five minutes, turn around, walk back, or even 10 minutes of housework. And then ongoing sessions with physiotherapy, both respiratory and musculoskeletal if deemed appropriate, ongoing treatment with occupational therapy, and then my follow-up. I generally follow up at two weeks to go through blood tests and just to check they're all doing okay. Um, and then at three months. Okay, I think that is everything. So what we are now going to do is divide into sort of uh, three sections to go through a few more bits in detail. And we have Sharon who will be talking um, next. Oh, sorry, so I didn't, I forgot about this. This is just an example of how much detail I put in my clinic letters. And just under the impression is that kind of biopsychosocial formulation. So apologies, um, I skipped that. So on to Sharon. Lovely, thank you, Polly. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about anxiety and remind us of the role of the nervous system. And then I'll explain how physiotherapy can influence anxiety and long COVID symptoms. I'm sure that everyone here understands anxiety and has experience of managing it within their clinical work. We found that patients often arrive to the clinic anxious and the Yorkshire screening tool, which Polly mentioned, has allowed us to identify that many of these patients also experienced high levels of anxiety prior to long COVID. And anxiety can manifest physically with a variety of symptoms, including shortness of breath, increased pain, palpitations, and trembling. And the goal of physiotherapy intervention is to reduce the sympathetic nervous symptom activation and physiologically reduce the anxiety. So we know that the prefrontal cortex is the center for rational logical thought and that tempers anxiety. Then the prefrontal and anterior cingulate cortex amplifies that negative information and tends to enhance anxiety. And both of those then feed down to the amygdala, which will trigger the fight or flight response and activate the sympathetic nervous system. Repeated activation and overstimulation will lead to hypersensitivity and patients experiencing an increased response to triggers. And this can sometimes occur just in a generalized anxiety state where there's no real trigger. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so symptoms which are covered and managed by the musculoskeletal physiotherapists include, but are not limited to, anxiety, central sensitization, which is more likely in the presence of anxiety. So the normal or subthreshold afferent input can result in hypersensitivity to stimuli, responsiveness to non-noxious stimuli, increased pain response evoked by stimuli outside the area of injury. And within musculoskeletal pain, we've noticed a bit of a trend within the patients who have passed through the clinic to date in that, um, say for example, resolved historical low back pain is presenting as an exacerbation. So it could be secondary to patients having increased sedentary behavior due to fatigue 
or um, as Polly sort of alluded to, patients are sort of sometimes presenting with neck um, and upper shoulder pain. And when thinking of when people are anxious, we often hold ourselves quite tight and tense. So again, that's linking the musculoskeletal symptoms that they may present to our part of the team with and anxiety. For headaches and dizziness, well, these could be cervicogenic, viral or vestibular. And as MSK physios will help to put those into the correct box and treat accordingly. Shortness of breath, reduced exercise tolerance, muscle weakness and fatigue. Next slide, please. So looking back to anxiety, the goal is to deactivate the sympathetic and activate the parasympathetic nervous system, thus promoting physiological change. And physiotherapy, it's known to have a strong therapeutic effect, which was shown in 2021 by McKay Batal. And we really communicate fantastically within the interdisciplinary team. So again, we're all reinforcing the same message and clinical advice to the patient, resulting in, the maximi in maximizing the positive therapeutic effect and outcome. As MSK physios, you know, we've got our core skill set. So joint mobilization, stretching, massage, education, and also with this client group, I'd bring in vestibular rehabilitation under that umbrella. And again, calming that sympathetic nervous system and influence of the memories and information descending from the amygdala. So it's helping the body to be reminded what normal is. Um, research by Abwin Porras et al. showed that manual therapy produces an increase in the parasympathetic nervous system and a reduction in the sympathetic nervous system. So from our side, through treating pain, the patient is better able to cope with other long COVID symptoms and also more likely to engage in other clinical advice. Relaxation techniques, that tends to form part of our treatment plan as well. So it may be something like progressive muscular relaxation, deep breathing exercises, mindfulness. So we identify which technique may be suited to the individual. Um, and it's been proven that relaxation techniques reduce stimulation to the sympathetic nervous system. I have to say sometimes patients roll their eyes or don't look particularly enthralled at the, fact, the um, prospect of engaging in these sort of techniques. But I find that once I'm addressing other MSK concerns. I can sort of gradually build in a technique that will work with them and they'll engage with. From a basic respiratory management side, we will do breathing control exercises for shortness of breath, relaxed breathing positions. And, you know, there is a link between shortness of breath and anxiety, but we must remember also that some patients can have the physiological changes secondary to COVID. And then we've got Jenny, who will be speaking later, who's our specialist respiratory physio. And she's the one who we go to for all those complex patients. So coping strategies and advice. We um, commonly use a diary to help develop the patient's rehab plan and progression. Um, it's really important for long COVID patients to include triggers and warning signs to help them balance activities with rest to optimise their recovery. Um, guidance on pacing, modification of ADLs and return to work, including the possibilities of graded return. We found that the age range of clients coming through our long COVID service are often in their 30s and 40s. So within that um, age, you've got lots of people who are working and with young families who can be quite demanding and somewhat tiring. And then we have Christine, our OT, who helps us again with these complex patients. So we address both return to activity and or exercise, as in a lot of cases, we're guiding the patients back to activities like housework, childcare, gardening, gardening 
And we see that all of these are important for well-being and health, even though not formal exercise. NICE cautioned against using graded exercise for patients with long COVID, and it is a topic of ongoing development. Graded exercise uses fixed incremental increases, and we're not suggesting this approach at all. Um, it is a huge and often controversial topic and not the focus of this presentation. Um, within the long COVID clinic, though, what we tend to do is provide a highly individualised exercise programme, which is patient specific and symptom guided. So we'll consider oxygen desaturation, post-exertional malaise, cardiac symptoms, orthostatic hypertension, autonomic dysfunction. And we have things flagged up from the Yorkshire screening tool, which Polly um, talk to you about earlier on so we can again combine that information we've attained at assessment right through that patient journey um, and you know safe and effective rehab is a fundamental part of their recovery um, but setting it at pace which is appropriate for the patient's current er energy level at that time which we know can vary considerably um, also it's good to exercise um, Activities known to reduce anxiety and depression and lack of exercise and movement can result in a raised PHQ-9 score. Um, also, um, sedentary behaviour is a leading cause of morbidity and being physically active is important for all areas of health, cardiovascular mm -hmm. and respiratory, as well as mental health. Um, next slide, please. So this is my last slide, and I actually use this one with lots of patients within my um, clinic. And I take the view that this bucket, it could be stress, it could be anxiety, and that we've all got stress in our lives. Presenting is quite stressful, I think everyone would agree. And some of it's good stress and motivational, but only if it's at a normal level. And we can only cope with so much stress in our buckets and effectively managing that stress has a positive effect on regulating mild depression and anxiety. So what we do is we ask the patients to identify what their stresses are um, and we sort of like um, explain that it's fine if they can't eliminate them, but just identify them and try and to reduce them so that they increase their awareness. And then using tools to reduce them. And those tools are the holes in the bucket. And sometimes we'll need more holes in our buckets. And, and sometimes we'll get away with slightly less. And those tools to reduce that stress, they could be things like talking, exercise, relaxation, cooking, Lego, cycling. And um, actually, after listening to Mark this morning, I'll be encouraging cold water swimming. So, you know, whatever works for you. And this helps patients to maintain and increase their resilience as well. Um, and... What we're suggesting really is that the patients can then recognise their own levels and signs of unhealthy stress or anxiety and promote some sort of like self-management. Also, we know that lowering stress and anxiety reduces the production of cortisol, which is a physiological benefit in really reducing anxiety. Thank you. Uh, hello, so it's over to me. I am going to talk to you about the occupational therapy role within the long COVID service. Um, and just to re-mention that Maxine Haylock is uh, credited here as she has written this presentation um, and I'm getting the honour of presenting it to you. Um, and my name is Christine Parr, as I say, the specialist in uh, a background of neurology. Next slide, please. Just to give you a brief background about occupational therapy because we turn up all over the place and our roles are very varied. Um, the Royal College of Occupational Therapists have stated that we work in rehabilitation teams and our roles are to enable people to regain and maintain independence in the occupations or activities of daily living that matter to them. Next slide. Um, they go on to suggest that we are working in these three main areas, 
So independent living skills are at the core of a lot of our work. Um, so with the long COVID population, we're looking at whatever the strategies, techniques, equipment, adaptations, whatever it might be to be as independent as possible in your sort of day-to-day -day functioning. Self-management approaches. So once all the adaptations have been made, what do people have to, to, to manage with on a day-to-day -day basis and how can they optimise their self-management approaches to be as independent as possible? And personalised care, which I'm sure we're all, um, we all do this. Uh, each person has an, a tailored um, intervention uh, according to their own preferences, their traits, and of course, how their illness presents to them. Next slide. And just one last bit on occupational therapy, because we like to make ourselves known. Uh, this is the sort of thing that occupational therapists have in their thinking when they're doing their assessment and their treatment plans. At the core is how do people do the things that they want to do? So occupational performance and participation. And we have our philosophy that suggests that, if, that our health and well-being comes from being able to engage in those activities or occupations that we all like to do. And they form part of our roles, routines, habits, and essentially offer us that well-being and quality of life that we usually experience when we don't have ill health in the way. Uh, or disability. So with our long COVID population, there's obviously factors in that that will have been adapted or changed or removed for, uh, for that person, which will all have an impact on their ability to engage in their typical occupations. So this is the sort of thing that we would be considering. Next slide, please. But actually what I want to spend my time talking to you about mainly is the interventions that we are mainly using with people. And as already mentioned, fatigue is one of the most commonly reported symptoms that certainly I work with um, with people. And it is it's a big feature of people with long COVID and obviously other conditions. So this is a big part of our work and it's generally our starting point. Um, so we will talk to people at length about what it is that how is their fatigue affecting them? So we start to do lots of education around trying to get people around the concept of having an energy resource as a battery, which is what that picture on the left is supposed to be. We find with people with long COVID that their battery of energy is massively depleted. And often that means that they really struggle to do any of their activities. What can then happen um, with the graph that you see on, on the right there is that people will have possibly a bit of a better day, They'll do loads and loads of things because they're having a good day, but then they will have this crash and that crash can last hours. It can last days. It can last weeks in some cases. And the recovery is often much slower and doesn't quite reach that same point again, but they have a better day. And then again, they, they do more and crash and so on and so on. And what we see is that over time, the battery of energy is, is gradually being depleted. So with the long COVID fatigue um, that I'm seeing in people, it, often the reserve is just not there. So it's really starting to try and get some sense of reserve as a baseline to work from uh, and to reduce this boom bust pattern. So we're looking at any way of keeping energy reserves. What we tend to do if people can manage it is to ask them to do a fatigue diary. So what are the things you're doing, even if they're small? Is it getting out of bed, brushing your teeth right through to going back to work activities? And in that, what are the things that are really fatiguing you? And then we'll also look at what the components of that particular task might be. So are the, are the fatiguing components physical, physical? Are they cognitive or are they emotional? And people don't always necessarily consider all three of those aspects. So that in itself is quite a useful education piece. People can start to reflect on things in a slightly different way. And it helps us to target how we're going to treat those particular issues. So then pacing is key to everything. We will, by educating people about how energy is being used, um, we can then look at people people's energy levels across a day, start to see if there are any patterns where they have slightly better moments in the day and look at how to place activities appropriately to try and reduce this kind of boom and bust. Um, goal setting is really key for all of our clients. 
particularly those who have very minimal activity, because actually we need to make every little piece of progress something measurable to give them that ongoing sense of hope and progress. Um, so that is a really important thing to identify. And the goals might be really small for some people. The only other thing I really wanted to say about this is that people will have crashes. There is no doubt about it. And I think actually it's a, it's slightly human nature to kind of push your luck. As soon as you are feeling a bit better, of course, you don't want to be having this fatiguing condition. And of course, you're going to you're going to try and do more. So actually, I think it, it's only inevitable to a certain extent that people will, as I say, push their luck. And actually, we just need to support and guide them through that. Because I think if I was to have this condition, I would certainly do that myself. Um, so it's, it's just to kind of acknowledge that it, that is kind of part of the process. And actually, if people don't push their luck a little bit, that would worry me more because you start to worry that their motivation and perhaps their mental health might be starting to be affected. Next slide, please. We do look at a 24 hour picture and sleep and relaxation are a really key part of our role within the long COVID cohort. Obviously, following a chronic illness, sleep patterns might be altered because of the, necess the necessity of sleep. Um, but then we start to get into a what, when is it a habit, when is it a bad habit, and when is it necessary? So we, so we have to look at people's sleep patterns. There are some reports of sleep insomnia as a result of long COVID, and the understanding around that is still fairly limited. However, what we can offer in terms of some sort of treatment for that is some uh, reassurance about managing to get some, some sense of sleep or restorative time. So there have been studies of people who are particularly good at meditation, and it's suggested that they can get their brain waves into a similar pattern of that of early sleep. So by being able to impart that to your clients, that can help them take some of the anxiety about, am I going to get to sleep tonight? Am I not getting any restorative time whatsoever? So even giving them that little nugget can be really helpful. And then it, it's also a buy-in to try out different relaxation techniques that we can start to implement. And it's another tool to help give people a little bit of a sense of control over something rather than just feeling like it's all happening to them. Lots of resources available. So there's one on the slide there. And the other bit that we really emphasize with people, and this is a really key part, is rest. And we have conversations with people about rest. What is it to you? And is it actually restful? So for some people, sitting and watching a movie might be previously considered quite restful. But in the context of long COVID, is it now? It might be that actually that's still too much stimuli and it's not actually completely restful. So again, education around what rest is, getting good quality rest, use of relaxation, because actually going and resting in a silent background is not a very comfortable place for a lot right. of people. So some sense of low grade in my pocket. Having disorientating having this. Oh, sorry, oh. someone's speaking. <laughs> some sense of having a tool that they can use so that they're not in complete silence um, is really useful. So and also once we've got established rest patterns or rest tools we can start to use that to implement in the day so if they are if there is a particular task they know that's coming up that's going to be draining they can start to use these rest breaks as a tool to prepare for that before and after perhaps so it's um it's all part of the pattern next slide please I would say <clears throat> it's fairly inevitable that there would be some mood issues that come from an ongoing fatiguing condition um, and long COVID where there's lots of concerns and, and uh, question marks about what the, what the future holds. So we do have a space to speak with people about the consequences of having um, long COVID and, and how that's making people feel. And we can talk to people about their worries. We can use some cognitive behavioural style techniques to try and help manage some of those thought processes. And again, use tools like self-soothing techniques, grounding techniques to give people something that they can use to help manage some of the stress that is in slightly inevitable from this sort of condition, um, which obviously we want to reduce stress as much as possible because that's another thing that's going to drain that battery that we're constantly trying to kind of preserve any energy from.
next uh, next slide please <clears throat> This is my background as well with neurological changes. And this is this is a commonly reported or can be quite common, um, this sort of brain fog term that's used. And this is where there's quite a lot of similarities in features with the MTBI population, where they'll have very similar sort of presentation or descriptions about how they their sort of cognitive function is, uh, is for them at the time. So people will report things like poor concentration, poor memory, reduced attention and poor executive functioning. And our role as OTs is to, again, look at what the tasks are that they're noticing it the most in and to, to pick that apart a little and see if there's any way of reducing some of the load. So it might be visual, visual filters are used to, to reduce some of the visual load, um, memory techniques, lists, uh, dictaphones, mind mapping for more complex thinking patterns. Whatever it might be, we, we just try to explore with people what it is within that task that we could perhaps help to take some of the load out of it where possible. Next slide, please. And this, again, links in part to some of the vocational rehabilitation work we do with people. Obviously, we're keen, as, as Sharon said, a lot of our population are working age and we're keen to get people back to their work roles and responsibilities and get a sense of those meaningful roles that they have. As OTs, we then look at the job demands analysis so what is it that that person needs to do within their work role and then a functional capacity evaluation where is that person at at the moment and what is in that gap in between and then we can look whether there's any things to bridge that gap and then discuss with occupational health teams about the sorts of strategies or reasonable adjustments that might need to be made to help that person to get back to work and that's me thanks very much Hello. I'm just checking you can hear me okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm Jen Turnbull. Uh, my specialist background, as Polly mentioned, is, um, is respiratory. Um, and I'm very fortunate to work with the, with the team here. So we've, you've heard a lot about and, and a little, that you, what you can see already is what Sharon and Polly and um, Christine have talked about, there's a lot of overlapping and you'll, you'll hear that again from me. So the really the people, the people that we are going to be particularly interested in is this group of um, severe and very severe at the bottom of the screen. So that's 17, 20%. And they really need this kind of focused um, MDT intervention and some hand holding to navigate their back way back to restoration. And um, so the evidence is emerging and for our rehab programs, they are really effective at getting people back to work and back to their normal function. And it's a really small number of people that are not managing to do that, that have um, post COVID or long COVID sy symptoms. Um, so that's just a just a, a mention there. So um, the ONS figures um, in November um, have demonstrated that in the long COVID, so those people that report ongoing symptoms at twelve feet uh, at twelve weeks, fatigue is reported by the majority of people at fifty five percent, and then breathlessness is next, and cough. So the bit that I'm interested in um, comes in around fifth, uh, about 27% of the people that are reporting. What you also see is that smell and concentration uh, are also affected quite a uh, quite a high level. And what that suggests, so from what the literature is reporting, um, is that there's some ongoing neurological changes that are driving um some of some of that change to help inform our practice and I think certainly for me I think last week I did a literature search on on post-covid and there were about 300 pieces of literature that were coming out so I kind of feel like my knowledge is a bit like a squeeze box it kind of ekes out and there's all of this information and I'm like how what do you deal how do you manage all of that information and then we take it back to this kind of functional approach to rehabilitation next slide please Polly so 
focusing in uh, for, for what I'm going to talk to you about, and that's breathlessness and cough and exercise. So in the acute phase, the um, symptoms of breathlessness are driven by that dry, direct lung and um, cardiorespiratory um, and cardiovascular cardiovascular and neurological damage that occurs and it's an upregulation and it's entirely appropriate. What happens though and what we see um, where we see kind of dysfunctional breathing patterns or hyperventilation um, symptoms that that people come to clinic with is that there's that the normal reset that occurs on in the system um, as that acute those acute changes reduced down that reset button isn't pressed so they don't go back to a normal breathing pattern and that's often what our focus is in respiratory outpatients with those patients with hyperventilation or dysfunctional breathing or chronic cough and what we see in terms of the 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 reported um changes that go on in that chronic phase and I was really fortunate to sit in on a presentation there's a allied health professionals leaders group that is comprised of dietitians and um, dietitians and occupational therapists and speech and language therapists and other therapists and um, from around the country and we had um, a, a professor from UCLH that came in and talked about what the the underlying mechanisms that Polly alluded to earlier and um, what basically Basically, what he said is if we keep searching for what's the driving mechanisms, we will find something. But what does it actually mean for the population? So we know that there are ongoing changes with autoimmune, neurological autoimmune, neuropeptide changes and neuroinflammatory changes that are ongoing and it both in the brain and then those changes happening in the autonomic nervous system, um, eosinophilia in some cases, and these kind of low level inflammation and uh, micro embolic changes in the pulmonary system. But how does that actually change? How does that inform our practice? What does it change about our practice? And, and, what he said in their clinics, so in their cardiovascular and their respiratory clinics, it isn't actually changing practice very much because the evidence-based treatment for those for those systems is not there. So it's we're with the the symptom symptomatic treatment for autoimmune. It, it's based on symptoms. So the, the evidence is, is emerging. And so we come back to that, that approach that, that we've already talked, to, talked about, the, the functional approach. And the evidence is emerging for this approach um, for our patients with ongoing breathlessness um, and cough problems and some of the neurological symptoms. And the key thing is that we, we, treat, we treat the person as, as a whole so we know in the chronic phase there is this that some of these changes that are ongoing so we can see um, on CT and PET scans that in the amygdala um, center and some of the brain centers that there's there's increased imaging um, and increased activity in those centers for memory and um, an emotion that also that are also existing for people with chronic fatigue symptoms and chronic pain symptoms. So we're seeing a, a similar pattern emerging. But what we what we know is that there is a deconditioning component to this. So as we're not moving around, our muscles become deconditioned, and then you will become breathless for a given amount of activity. We know that the um, autonomic nervous system changes, the POTS and the dysfunctional breathing will also feed into that chronic breathlessness. And then in terms of cough hypersensitivity, so I um, did some a significant amount of, of research into this and the ERS guidelines that came out in 2020 for cough, chronic cough, which is called They've, they've renamed it as cough hypersensitivity. A lot of those mechanisms we're seeing in the neurological changes for our post-COVID 
cohort of patients. And um, Sharon certainly alerted alluded to them earlier on when she was talking about anxiety that driving sim some of the symptoms that patients experience. Uh, next slide please Polly. So it, as Polly said it is about treating the modifiable so post-COVID is a diagnosis of exclusing of exclusion and we are as I said extrapolating from our evidence um, and it's a bespoke and individualized approach. Next slide, please, Polly. So in normal breathing, as you guys will know, um, inhalation is active. It's mainly driven by the diaphragm, uh, a resting respiratory rate, and then exhalation is passive. So it's a passive process. And what we see in patients as they, as they become breathless is that that pattern changes. Normal breathing is subject to a complex regulation. So there's, um, and if you click again, Polly, we might have a ne little next bit coming up on this slide. So as we talk, as we eat, as we drink, as you move around, your body has to respond to all of those changes. Um, and, um, and our emotional state will also feed into that as well. Next slide, please, Polly. So breathlessness is, is, is a subjective and di distressing sensation where people are more aware of that, of their, their changes in their breathing. So their amygdala and their anxiety systems are going to be stimulated. And, um, and it can be a mixture of breath, breathing in excess of metabolic needs, that's hyperventilation, or what you might see in some of our patients is a, a, a overuse of, or just, inappropriate use of, of muscles. Next um, next click slide, Polly. And then of course, as, as we become fearful, understandably, and understandably for people who have been experiencing three, six months of symptoms that are beyond their control, they will become fearful and they'll avoid activities. Understandably, you do less, your muscles become weaker and then for that given amount of activity, you're more breathless. So it's a self-fulfilling cycle. Next slide, please, Polly. So dysfunctional breathing pattern, um, it's an alteration in the biomechanics and we tend to look at it um, as structural and organic and functional, and it may be thoracic or extra thoracic um, in its odd origin on either side. And, um, and that's really important that we understand what's driving some of those, some of the, some of those uh, mechanisms so that we can um, help to, to treat them. Next slide, please, Polly. So, um, and we know from our existing practice and certainly more recently, so this is from 2011, um, we know that there's, there's a, a long-term follow-up um, improvement in symptoms with people with dysfunctional breathing with or without asthma. Um, but we, we also know from more recent studies that using the state, same strategies for breathing pattern retraining that we use in existing patients for people with a primary respiratory condition or um, a non-respiratory condition, that these strategies are effective. Next slide, please, Polly. So thinking about cough and um, so um, for, for the gentleman that, that Polly talked about earlier on, he had, um, he, he really just had a hyperventilation. So his breathing, um, his breathing pattern was rapid and shallow. So just needed to slow down. But one of the techniques that his body had, um, had tricked him into, if you like, for want of a better description, was that um, every now and again would be... <coughs> So as you're doing that, you're getting rid of carbon dioxide. So you're keeping that level low. So that center in your brain, in your medulla is set to uh, a lower level, uh, a lower acceptable level of carbon dioxide. So coughing can come from lots of different reasons. And the ERS guidelines in 2020 came out in a really timely way. So we should think about um, respiratory or non-respiratory or extra thoracic reasons for driving that. 
And certainly the NICE guidelines that came out for COVID um, talked about in that early stage, thinking about the, the initial factors that that could be modifiable, for instance, um, reflux. Um, the, the problem comes, and, and actually the treatment for, for, for chronic cough is that you, although the initial mechanism, so the initial cause might be reflux for that coughing, the brain, that initial stimulus might have gone away, but the hypersensitivity continues. And the EURES guidelines uh, went into detail about about that mechanism for hypersensitivity. And it's the, se a, a, the same mechanism um, that we see really in, um, in post-COVID patients. Next slide, please, Polly. So the treatment um, for, for cough management, it is, again, as Polly mentioned right at the beginning, this is a cognitive behavioral approach to, um, to therapeutic interventions. Uh, it, uh, uh, so four stage uh, approach to um, cough management in, in terms of educating patients about what the mechanisms are and promoting their confidence and control. And that's where the therapy comes in. It's that coming alongside and journeying with the, the patient through changing behaviours, which they seemingly have had no control over, and then making adjustments. And we saw, uh, and we've seen from the a seminal study um, by Thomas et al., uh, um, the, the London group and Chamberlain, that um, this approach is really effective in the early stages. And the next clicks, um, Polly, in the longer term, and it's effective in patients with primary respiratory conditions and non-respiratory conditions. So we know it's effective for both, both those cohorts. Um, next slide, please, Polly. So really simple, you know, keeping it simple, um, treat the triggers, uh, whatever they are, and then um, irritant reduction reduction and the most important thing so really encouraging people to nasal breathe when they nasal breathe they'll uh, the primary influence for for breathing is it stimulates the uh, diaphragm rather than your accessory muscles so it will reduce oscillations in flow and also hydrate the upper airway so um, good laryngeal hygiene and good um good flu oral intake is really important. Next slide, please, Polly. Ah, yes. So one of the biggest tricks was to, if you get that urge, encouraging them to just swallow. Uh, again, kind of depends on what the underlying mechanisms are that are causing that ongoing um, irritation, but it's a really good trick that works. So just really coming back to that um, individualized approach to activity and exercise res restoration that Sharon talked about. So very controversially, the um, World Physiotherapy Guidelines came, came out earlier in the year and, um, and they are very conservative. So it was quite a difficult, I, it was a difficult read for me, certainly, because I was like, where do we go with treatment? How do we treat anybody with this condition? How do we get them back to, to what they were doing before? But actually rereading what they're saying is although a graded exercise approach is not recommended and it's not recommended in our chronic fatigue and um, ME cohorts because it is, um, it, it's a stepwise increment in activity regardless of the response. And we know that that doesn't work because we know the journey for our patients with post-COVID symptoms is, is, is very variable. So um, it is, however, if you're, if you're providing an individualized prescription that's um, symbiotic with a holistic approach, looking at their activity and exercise, um, focusing on those sub-symptom thresholds. So post-exertional um, symptoms are about looking at, at the activity and exercise um, together so that you, um, you don't stimulate the, the constant cycle of, of boom bust and symptom um, irritation um, and, and risk managing it along the way. And, um, and your recent guidelines, so I've included them in there, um, 
give a really good guidance as to when that activity should restart. Um, the difficulty is when you've got that patient in front of you that's that's talking about ongoing symptoms. Where do, where do, where do you start that? And actually, um, as Christine and Sharon have alluded, it's about trying to find that that baseline safe zone to for activity and building from there. Uh, next slide, please, Polly. So just to mention, there are a number of pilots that have come out recently. So more and more evidence is emerging for post-COVID rehabilitation. So the, the study that was done at, at St. Thomas's. And uh, <laughs> so I would say that, that I think we did this in the middle of the pandemic last year. And our post-COVID uh, rehab programme is yet to start. I'm very embarrassed to say, um, even though it's really effective. So patients felt much better after the course in this low number and this has been repeated nationwide next slide please Polly so incremental shutter walk sit stand and MRC scores so breathlessness scored all showed um, clinically meaningful differences um, in the change from the beginning of the course to the end of the course so we know that this approach is effective next slide please Polly and there's some really useful resources um, for guiding and um, advising your patients with. Thank you very much. Next slide, please, Polly. Over to you, I think. Thanks, Jenny. Um, just give me a few minutes just to get on to the next one. So um, just to finish up, I thought we'd just give an overview of the number of patients we've seen and what sort of happened to them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I don't know if you remember that initial patient pathway. We've had 21 patients that have come into that initial consultation with myself. Um, and from, from there, two were not deemed appropriate for the IDT clinic. So one, unfortunately, was so incapacitated, it would have been too exhausting for her to attend. And another one was diagnosed with a different neurological condition. So 19 came into the long COVID IDT clinic. Um, two were assessed and deemed not to be, to have post COVID syndrome or long COVID. Um, and three left the service due to some senior management um, decisions made uh, at Spire Central. So we were left um, with 14 still under our care of which one is still not reached their three month review point. So um, what I wanted to show you was our outcomes um, which I discussed at the very beginning. Um, so we've got our GAD7 which is our anxiety, the initial is the teal color and then we've got the sort of magenta is the three month and you can see nicely that both their anxiety and their depressive scores are coming down. Um, understandably, as the COVID functional score, um, which I can show you, is quite generalised. The score has improved, but not hugely. And then we've got that significant improvement with um, the work, work and social adjustment score and then Childer as well. And for those of you that don't know the Childer score, it's really hard to do well on it. <laughs> Sometimes um, I wonder whether I would score quite highly. So the fact that we sort of reduced the score by that much is, is very positive. And then going on to our EQ5, D5L. So I talked about those five domains. And what you can see there is the domains at the bottom. So mobility, self-care, um, usual activities, pain and anxiety and depression. And they've gone from relatively high scores in mobility, usual activities, pain to much improved. And then in terms of self-care, um, there's a slight improvement and anxiety and depression as well. And then with our health score, there's, be, there's also been improvement, but not as great as I'd like to sort of demonstrate. We have had two patients who unfortunately regressed at the three month point, um, which have brought our scores up quite significantly, but actually um, I'm pleased to say one of them is actually doing very well again. So just going on from there. So just another refresher of how our service works, and I thought it might um, stimulate a few more questions. So I'll leave that up on the screen, but um, that's the overview of our service. Hopefully you've got a little bit of a feel for what we do and how the different um, 
allied health care professionals work and how we all work together. Um, I'll be welcome to uh, have any questions. Thank you, Polly and team. Really, really good to hear all the detail of that service you've created over this time. Um, I'm sure your patients are highly appreciative of the, of the detail that you've all put into that. Um, so I'll welcome any questions into the chat box or of course you can raise your hands as well. I actually have a sneaky question first, please. I just wondered, a lot of the elite sport um, long COVID studies we've done has matched some of those outcomes with uh, lung x-rays as well. And I just wondered if you'd, especially with the um, hypersensitivity to cough, whether at that stage in the uh, post 12 weeks, whether that's matched to any findings imaging wise, or have you just left imaging out of outcomes completely? So we haven't um, involved imaging from that point of view. We, I think it was about half of our patients came from the respiratory physician. So um, he had sort of worked them up and was managing them from an x-ray point of view. So he had done all those x-rays and was happy. But in terms of outcomes, we didn't do any imaging um, follow-up. The only other outcomes that we did that haven't been included on here, um, and that's partly we sort of needed to get all that information together was we did a, um, a one minute sit to stand. And Jenny, there was one other outcome that we did, didn't we? In turn. Oh, you're on mute, Jenny. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the BPAT, which is um, the Brompton breathing pattern assessment. So that, yes. So those yeah. are the ones that we did. I mean, we generally spent 45 minutes to an hour with each patient so we had to be a bit mindful of not doing too much <laughs> no absolutely and of course you know you're not a multi-centered trial so you, you can't expect to have that level but I just wondered if that that yeah. had been included at all um okay I think you had a question as well didn't you um yeah thanks thanks Polly and team um it was, I think, to go back to your explanation of the investigation side of it. So we talked about the blood tests and I just obviously noticed that there was there was a celiac screen on there. Um, I guess for me, it's interesting to know the rationale behind doing all of the and then the, the balance of that and over investigating and then medicalizing patients at that at that point. Um, so, yeah, just interested to hear your views on that. Um. Does anyone else want to speak, team? <laughs> or shall I keep going? The, you're shaking your head? Great, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, it would be interesting to know what you define as over medicalization. Interestingly, we set up our, it took quite a while to get our service going due to lots of paperwork that had to be completed and it had to go to Spire Central. So actually, by the time we, get, we got going, we were, it was January, was it January this year, I think? Um, so we had a lot of patients that came that actually had had COVID since March, or long COVID, sorry. So there was, they, they'd already had it for a long, long time. So it, and a lot of them were concerned and anxious about things. So it seemed, it was, it was very helpful or appeared to be very helpful to sort of exclude it straight away at that initial consultation, get the bloods done, feel happy that you've done it. And because their symptoms were so um, lengthened and prolonged, I would have felt quite negligent not to have done a certain number of blood tests. And the reason I've chosen, um, it was they were all up there, weren't they, on that slide? The reason those were chosen is there's a couple of good editorials um, written by GPs about fatigue um, I think it's on the BMJ. I'm, I'm welcome to send it across to anyone if they find it. And they talk about, you know, the, the ability to review your patient and fatigue normally sorts itself out within three months. But the majority of our patients, when we started our service, we were seeing after nine months of symptoms. Mm. So, uh, so I think, I think it's, and that you raise a really good point, Kay, um, in that we're seeing a, quite a, a sort of a certain cohort we were seeing people that could afford to come to us because it was a private service but also we were seeing those ones that had had really sort of ongoing symptoms so the more complicated long covid we weren't like a gp who you'd go oh i'm still still feeling ill at four weeks i'll go and see them they often so it it was they were more complicated and needed more things doing for them if that makes sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I guess my comment is the the upscaling of, of of these types of services and and their then 
whether they whether they would deem being able to be absorbed by other sorts of services already established. So within an NHS setting, obviously we've got chronic fatigue services yeah. running within rheumatology, or it depends what, which trust you're working for. Would yeah. your feeling be that this would need, a, this actually does need a standalone service because of the multi-system um, kind of outcomes from having long COVID or could it be that it could fit within other services that are already established? Um, so I'll answer that in two parts. I mean, I think it was clear that we got the, the complex end of the spectrum of long COVID patients. So I think if you were set up in an NHS system, this would, I mean, I don't know the, the, the percentages, but I imagine this would be a smaller proportion of your caseload. So in terms of doing that extent of investigations, I think is appropriate for the smaller minority that is more complicated with more um, ongoing symptoms that are more interrelated. The ones that got those bloods were only the ones that long, came to long COVID clinic, but by virtue of the fact that we saw 21 patients and 19 came to that long COVID clinic shows how complicated they were. In terms of could they be absorbed into a chronic fatigue service? I mean, I, I would defer to my colleagues to help me out here, because I, ha I haven't, I, I feel long COVID and from my experience of chronic fatigue from the military that it is, they are different beasts. They, um, there is overlap, but some, there are things, some things that are quite unique to long COVID. So interestingly, and I think Sharon and I think, I mean, I think everyone spoke about this actually, we see a lot of this kind of increased sensitivity. So for example, some patients would have, um, you know, musculoskeletal thoracic pain from coughing so much, and they would have that in their acute COVID incident, but then that it would come back because they were anxious. And I, you know, I, I don't, you don't really see that in chronic fatigue. So there are other, there are other things, but, but then again, you know, it's that whole biopsychosocial approach. So it probably just needs a bit of more education and how do you manage those additional things? I think, what becomes clear from you know us chatting on on our long COVID WhatsApp um, group is that every service has different strings to their bow. So I think every service needs to work with the teams that they've got um, and make it work. But I think an understanding that there's a broad range of symptoms that can affect anybody's system can be interrelated and so on is is important um we we've, we've got a brilliant psychologist that's part of our team as well so there's just there's loads of things really um where would you guys agree christine sharon jenny nodding shall i can i say something yes <laughs> thank you so um for the NHS guidelines there are some some guidelines recommended um, for post-COVID symptoms and um, a standard chest x-ray and a full a blood screen including ferritin and um, TSH vitamin D and there are a couple of other markers uh, are recommended so there is a standard blood panel that's recommended to to again looking because looking for those um, diagnoses of exclusion so so treating anything that 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 can be manageable and if there are chest x-ray changes then they then that's onto the respiratory groups for manage or the respiratory consultant to manage that in case they they need steroids for for an underlying pneumonitis etc cetera, etc cetera. but once they're on management then the the approach that we that we've got may may come into it if they've got if they've got quite severe symptoms, then they might, then they'll probably need uh, support to, to resolve and move on from them. And we will see patients. So a few, a, a few will come through that have got chest x-ray changes, but on the whole, I think for this group, most of them didn't have an underlying um, chest x-ray change at the point that they came into the service. Yeah, which is fascinating, isn't it really? And I think um, the IDT approach is really interesting, moving from categorizing patients from that MDT to the IDT. And I think, I, I did, did you model that from something else, Polly, or did you you guys decide as a team that would be your strategy? So um, we, I mean, I was in, so obviously the, the military where a lot of us have worked, um, using interdisciplinary care so it 
it became clear to me that that would be really helpful for the kind of complex patients. But that kind of structure, I can't take full credit for. It was based on um, Manoj Sivan's work, who I, I think you're probably aware he's a rehabilitation consultant. He now sits on the WHO for long COVID. He was great and helped us with that long COVID handbook. Um, he, he did some of that stratification. Um, but he didn't, he, interestingly, he didn't stratify it into multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. So um, that's been more from our experience, I think. Yeah, great, thank you. Right, let me just check across the board to see whether there's any hands raised. And if not, we'll tie up the session, but it's been really great having you all on. Um, let me see. Yep, so nothing at the moment and nothing on the chat function. So, um, okay, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. And as, as some um, Polly has alluded to, there's there's a a group that are, are discussing kind of different SEM kind of focused um, long COVID. As I say, it, it, there's, there's the, the, there's different services out there. That obviously, Basim has produced the long COVID handbook, which hopefully in, um, a number of our members have um, have been able to access. And obviously, it's on our website as well. Um, but yeah, I'd really like to thank you for showing us just, as you say, that that certainly for me, the MDT versus the IDT um, approach is, is 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 really interesting, and um, and around management of cough, um, I think especially as kind of general practitioners, um, it's a good reminder. For we, all often, of us we often we often we often struggle, and there is some basic things about nose breathing and laryngeal hygiene. All these things, I, I will actually <laughs> use that tomorrow in my clinic. Um, um, really interesting. So, so thanks for that.